everyone and welcome back to my channel. Um, thank you all for your comments. I will get to your comments in due course. Try and do a comments video where I go through your comments like I did with the M5 Normality videos. So I will try and get through them in due course. Um, in this video, uh, I want to get on to um, Russell Barkley, as I said I would do in my other videos. Now, Russell Barkley is a renowned... Uh, research psychiatrist or research scientist um, in ADHD, that's his specialism. Um, and this, and he's actually done a video entitled, Is ADHD Good for Something? Um, is ADHD Good for Something in Terms of Evolution? And I thought I'd discuss his, um, Sorry, it was a video he did on this. You can actually watch it on YouTube. But I thought I'd actually discuss this video or go through what he said uh, because I feel it's a it's a interesting. It provides an interesting counterweight or counter argument to the Guardian article I talked about earlier, which argued that ADHD may have been an evolutionary advantage. So this is what Russell Barkley has to say on the matter, and I think it's a very very um, well-argued case, well-argued, well I think it's a very well-argued um, position and I completely agree with what Russell Barkley says because it, it seems to make a lot of sense to me. Okay, so let's get on to it. So, Russell Barkley says that there's this hypothesis that ADHD and I'd argue also, we, we, could, we could substitute ADHD with autism and any other condition because it's specifically relating to ADHD. There's a hypothesis that ADHD is not a disorder, but simply a mismatch between modern culture and traits that were adaptive earlier in evolution. So this would be a sort of um, very, very kind of like extreme social model, kind of arguing that you're not, it, you're not it's not your innate impairments that are causing disability, it's like 100% society sort of thing. Um, the idea that there's now this mismatch and that it's basically because of modern society and that's why ADHD is disabling, um, suggesting that in previous times, um, sort of prehistoric times, these traits were adaptive. So that's the argument of the cultural mismatch theory. So the idea argues that cultural evolution proceeded far more quickly than biological evolution, such that a set of traits that were once adaptive to human survival in earlier periods became maladaptive due to changes in culture, such that these traits are no longer adaptive. For example, the idea that ADHD represents earlier successful hunters during hunter-gatherer phase of evolution, now forced to live among farmers in contemporary culture, although as Russell Barclay mentions, in the developed world we don't really live in a kind of farming culture anymore, it's, it's very much an industrial culture, but that's the position that these people put anyway. But as Russell Barclay goes on to say, an alternative more scientifically based theory of ADHD as a set, as a set of maladaptive traits that can remain at a stable weight within the population. And this so-called conveyor belt theory, put forth by Keller, A.L., in 2000 and, et al., I should say, in 2008, argues that new mutations arise all the time in the risk genes for ADHD and other disorders in each new generation. In fact, it takes multiple generations for natural selection to remove those original mutations. Despite their being removed, new mutations continue to arise in the next generation that go on to create disorder. If the new mutation rate and the genetic removal rates, in terms of natural selection, weeding out the genes, reach a certain level of balance with each other, 
The result is a stable weight of a maladaptive trait disorder within a population. So let's say sort of about 5 to 8 percent as a constant kind of equilibrium within a population. So the available evidence, Barclay argues, is more consistent with this theory than the hypothesis of cultural mismatch. So then he goes on to talk about the adaptationist view, which is a cultural mismatch view, okay? So this argues that previously successful hunters during earlier Paleolithic era are now having to live in a civilization of farmers. That's the, adap that's the adaptationist view. And Russell Barclay talks about the, uh, a so-called bell curve of executive functioning and ADHD. So in this bell curve, a sort of bell curve, sort of normal distribution, bell curve, at one extreme of that bell curve, you would have those who are gifted in executive functioning. They would be right up, if you think of a bell curve, they'd be like right over here. They're like, they're gifted in executive functioning. They're quite exceptional. They would be a sort of minority of people who are gifted in executive functioning. Most people are in the middle of the bell curve of this normal genetic distribution of executive functioning. In this case, most people are bang normal, right in the middle. That's where you find a majority of people not gifted in executive functioning, not deficient, but having enough to get by adequately and perform socially expected, socially acceptable sort of tasks without being disabled. Most people are in the middle. It's a normal distribution. And of course, within that normal distribution, you will have a wide range of different abilities with regards to executive functioning. Some will be a bit better than others, some will not be quite as good at others, some people executive functioning might not be a strength. But nevertheless, they're all in this middle, broad average, perfectly normal range. That's in the middle of the bell curve. And then, as you go in this direction of the bell curve, sort of towards the left of the bell curve, you start to find people who are getting progressively more impaired in executive functioning. Not to the point of actual disorder, not to the point of clinical impairment, these people are still functioning fine in society, they're just not, they're just a bit lacking in executive functioning. So they're obviously maybe going to find life a bit more difficult than those sort of bang normal people, bang average. <laughs> um, they're going to find life a bit more difficult. They're not clinically significantly impaired yet, but they're moving in that direction. And once you get far enough towards the left of the bell curve, at the opposite extreme to those who are gifted, over on the extreme end to the right, at the extreme end to the left, you end up with those who are impaired, and right at the very far end of that, you end up with those who might get a diagnosis, in this case of ADHD, which is an executive functioning disorder. So that's the bell curve of like distribution. So you can see that this is a continuum. Um, and ADHD is on that continuum, but it's right at the very extreme end of that continuum. When you get to the extreme end of a continuum, you then have a break, you have a category. This is where we can have categories existing within a continuum. And, in, and, and, and that's a meaningful kind of break in a continuum at the extreme end of that continuum, where a group of people are so far away from where most people are in that continuum, that it makes sense to say that they have some have a disorder. Obviously, if you're at the other end of the extreme where you're gifted, then you don't have a disorder. That would be kind of like a great place to be, because if you're gifted with executive functioning, you're going to find life a breeze. I mean, that's really good. If you're going to be gifted in executive functioning, that's a very good place to be. Most people are not gifted, though. But that would be like at the other extreme. Um, so yeah, so that's the genetic sort of continuum of executive functioning. And it's similar, and, you, and there are bell curves for many different things. There's a bell curve for intelligence, bell curve for height, bell curve for weight. There's a bell curve for many different dimensions. 
where you get to the extreme of any dimension, you enter problem territory. If if that is if that extreme that is is that like a well yeah in most in most continua where you get to an extreme you enter problem territory. In most continua. Um. So. So yes, yeah, so ADHD Barkley says you know it's polygenic, polygenic, meaning you know it's not one gene, it's not two genes, it's not three genes even. It's like thousands of genes that are put people at risk of developing ADHD. But these genes are very widely distributed in the general population, just as in the same way as autism and other neuro conditions. So yeah, so Russell Barkley says, he also says, he says, adopting a false belief because it makes one feel better does not help with addressing any existing problems, but papers them over with a delusion. Owning one's deficiencies is the portal to self-acceptance and coping with or compensating for those deficiencies. So Barclay is very clear that this whole idea that ADHD was an evolutionary advantage is not supported by the evidence. The evidence actually shows the complete opposite, that these genes have been progressively weeded out by evolution. Um, the only reason why ADHD is hanging around is because there's a very high mutation rate. So for every time for, ge for genes, every, every, for every time some of the genes, and bearing in mind there are thousands of these genes, but every time these genes are weeded out by evolution, you end up with um, you end up with more mutations um, replacing the genes that have been weeded out. So you end up with a sort of equilibrium. That's like a conveyor belt theory. Um, anyway, I'm going to move over to video number two now to carry on looking at the evidence for this. So, moving over to video number two now.